360 degrees. High high, 360 degrees. High high, 306, 306, 360 degrees. High high. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Full Circle, your cultural affairs radio magazine, produced by members and graduates of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program, broadcasting from KPFA in Huchin, occupied Ohlone Territory, also known to settlers as Berkeley, California. And this week on Full Circle, we will honor Women's History Month with women and youth voices from the 50th anniversary of the occupation and liberation of Wounded Knee. On tonight's show, we'll hear youth poets as they share their poetry during the opening night of festivities, which honored 40 years of Keeley Radio, an independent Lakota-owned and operated FM radio station. We'll hear the voices of women veterans of the 1973 occupation and participants here at the 2023 50th anniversary of Wounded Knee. We'll also hear the voice of Wala, a Palestinian from Hebron, who stands in solidarity with the American Indian movement and liberation of Wounded Knee. That's tonight on Full Circle. I'm your host, Free Will and Franklin, coming to you from downtown Antioch. This is Bay Miwok territory. Keep it locked right here to KPFA. Yes, again, welcome to Full Circle, the weekly show produced by apprentices and graduates of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. My name is Free Will and Franklin, and I will be your host for tonight. And February 27th, 2023 marked 50 years since the 1973 occupation and liberation of Wounded Knee, South Dakota, a small patch of land located on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. It is the site of a massacre That occurred in 1890 when U.S. Army troops slaughtered approximately 300 men, women, and children. The 1973 occupation was to fight for the rights of the 1968 Fort Laramie Treaty, as well as the rights of traditional people in the Lakota territories who were under attack from a tribal government that worked hand-in-hand with the U.S. government to assure that traditional ways would be suppressed and assimilation would be a priority. There were many unsolved murders on the Pine Ridge Reservation and surrounding areas that left traditional people with no security and no way to get answers as to what happened and the deaths of their loved ones. This, along with centuries of occupation, led to the 1973 liberation of Wounded Knee, which lasted 71 days. Some of those days included gun battles between AIM activists and U.S. Marshals and FBI who had surrounded the area with military vehicles and assault rifles. This militarized response led to the deaths of two American Indian movement activists and a civil rights activist. KPFA staff, myself, Free Will and Franklin, Sarah Blanco, Miguel Gabilan Molina, and Tony Gonzalez traveled to South Dakota to attend the four-day festivities. And opening night was a celebration honoring 40 years of Keeley Radio Station, an independent Lakota-owned and operated FM radio station located in Porcupine Butte on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And the festivities included sharing stories, a hand drum contest, and a poetry slam. The following audio is from the Youth Poetry Slam by Dances with Words. And Dances with Words establishes creative spaces that support youth poets, artists, and storytellers to become the next generation of culture bearers grounded in ancestral knowledge and cultural values. And this segment kicks off with an interview I did with the Poetry Slam participants from Dances with Words, and I have dropped in their poems into the interview. Check it out on Full Circle KPFA. 
My name is uh, Pesawi Little Whiteman, and the organization that uh, we work for is First Peoples Funds. And the program that we work for that is also with First Peoples Funds is Dances with Words. Um, it's a youth led uh, poetry workshop hosted uh, primarily online or um, in person. It was mainly in person first, but then it became uh, virtual once pandemic. Since then, we've been trying to continue to engage with our youth and help give them the opportunities to write and perform and um, help give them the exposure of what it is to be a performer and the performing arts and um, oral and oral tradition is definitely something that us Lakotas uh, like to keep as in our culture because you know our culture is kind of faltering but um, we definitely try to uphold and um, kind of uplift our youth and their voices because they're important and we want them to be able to know that their voices and what they have to say is important. And tell us real quick about the poem that you performed tonight before we get to your, your friend here um, and then what it meant to you to be able to do that here at like a, such a, um, an important gathering. Yeah, so um, my poem I wrote is called Indigi Roots, and I wrote that back in 2021 when the residential schools started to become more... Uh, well known, more known. I've we've known about it for a very long time, but when it started to become more media based, um, I I took the time to kind of research a lot of people's opinions and their thoughts and what the media had to say and what I had heard in my own personal life because I grew up with my grandparents. So I kind of had firsthand experience to witness and listen to what they had to say about it as well and what their relatives had to say about it too. And it motivated me to write what I've written and it gave me an opportunity to put my anger someplace and give it a reason and a valid reason for me to be able to speak it out there. And you know, coming from a native individual as well um, I feel like it's more empowering coming from our voices and not just you know white media talking about you know oh the horrors of residential schools like it's not just the horrors of residential schools it's literally our trauma of what happened like what our our relatives endured and how we are now and what we're dealing with now is literally the um, result of it. So um, it was important for me to read this piece here. I wasn't originally going to read it here, but until I start like paying more attention to what they were discussing here and their um, aspirations, I realized this poem would be really good for me to read it here just because I feel like it's in an appropriate and safe space for people to actually listen and understand and also empathize with the fact that, yeah, it, it sucks and you know your anger is valid we're angry too and it was very empowering and helpful for me to be able to listen to the occasional like uh, akichita or akichita Aki, uh, the whoo, the little war hoop and the clapping whenever it got to like some subjects in my poem that were definitely heavy heavy hitting but a lot of people reacted well to that and it made me happy to know that people also feel the same they can also relate Happy Washta. Good evening. Uh, my name is Pesawi Little White Man. I'm Oglala Lakota, and I'm from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. I'll be reading a poem today, um, Trigger Warning, Violence Against Environmental Activists, PTSD, Residential Schools, The Oppression Caused by White People. We've known since the day our grandparents warned us of the white man, white and black gowns, gold crosses, and church bells ding and ring, and where did you put our children? We knew our children were gone the second they were ripped from their mother's arms, braids long enough to kiss Unchi Maha, skin so golden and brown, a language so descriptive and pure. Our grief of years of carnage didn't end with our children being taken, tortured, and killed. Cultural genocide lurks in the corners of each reservation. We've known long enough our culture and language became victims of colonization. White saviors claim they're helping us when whitewashing was doused in our culture, and we know history will repeat itself. Look where we are now. Not only our language and culture was murdered, but the spirits within our people too. Alcohol and drugs plague the lands, the homes, the people. The white man claims we are alcoholics, dirty and poor, when they're the ones who committed ethnic cleansing of not only thousands and thousands of people, but the imprisonment of our people's spirits, ankles and wrists bound to the chairs and chapels, burning infants and screaming children echo in the halls of confession. My people never believed in sin. Sin, a concept created by the white man to bastardize my people and make it okay for them to commit mass murder. 
funny how they call us savages when they're the ones praying in a church above thousands and hundreds of murdered indigenous children. They call us savages when they're the ones forcing people to believe a religion and murdering them for having a different belief, language, and heritage. You're not aware of our generational trauma. Trauma passed down to us the minute we take our first breath. Those cries you hear from that Native American newborn are the cries from our ancestors' grief from years of decimation being passed down to us because the pain will only fuel our strength to rekindle and take back what was stolen, revive what was broken. Native American activists are sentenced to prison for protecting our waters and lands, yet the government would claim, would like to claim this is an act of domestic terrorism. Really? We're not the ones drilling holes into Unchimaja, finding oil, committing deforestation to make room for cattle ranching or mining. Pipelines would cause hundreds of people in Nunchimaka to fall upon illness. But all you can think about is the money and how these white religious power mongers will think of you. Pathetic. Yet the government would like to claim and throw protectors behind bars because I guess that's the nature for you all since you've thrown our children behind walls of a religion beaten and fear-based into them to kill the Indian, save the man. My people were never greedy. We, ne we knew of gold on our lands, yet we never bothered with it because to us it wasn't valuable. We had other priorities than a shiny piece of rock. Gold drove the white man to kill, to rape, to enslave. So don't you dare try to say it happened so long ago, get over it. And then call us heartless for saying the same with 9-11, 2,996 people lost their lives, and yet you silence us for grieving millions of our indigenous people's lives that were taken. Not all of us are angry but our spirits still feel the pain and rage when we had to watch our people get hanged. Wopi la Tonka. Definitely, this is the place, and um, I'm glad you changed it up and uh, went with that one at the end. Well, let me come to your friend here. Um, have me, uh, I'll have you introduce yourself, and then um, tell me about the poem that you performed. Hello, I'm Jackson Claymore. I'm one of the participants in the Dances with Words program. And the reason why I read that poem, I was originally going to read a different poem as well, but with what they were talking about and whatnot, I decided it was, a good, it was probably best to read this one, even though I've already read it before, because um, I feel like with, um, with everything going on with the weather and with Unchimaka and everything, like I feel like it's a really important piece to read out because I love Unchimaka. I, I love her a lot and I feel like we're not taking good care of her and I just want people to appreciate her for who or what and who she cares about, which is us. And so that's mainly the reason why I wrote that piece and why I read that piece. And for people that don't understand the words or the language, tell us what um, Uchimaka? Mm Uchimaka. Uchimaka. Tell us um, about that word and what it means for those that don't speak your language. Yeah, um, so Uchi means grandmother, and Maka, I believe, means earth. So Uchimaka is grandmother earth. That's what it means. And so you reflecting that it's important to honor the earth, take care of the earth as it takes care of us. Yes, and listen to Unchimaka too, because she's talking to us, she's telling us. It's just, we just, we're just not listening. Unchimaka, her spirit lives inside me like everything and everyone else. When I lay down on the green grass and focus on Unchimaka, I can feel her heart beating and feel the comfort she's providing me. The wind kisses my cheek as it blows through the tall trees that protect me, and the sun and the sun shines down on me, keeping me warm and safe. I feel as though I'm being cradled by Unchimaka. The sound of the river flowing and the wind whistling as it blows reminds me of singing. And when I close my eyes, I can see her. Singing one of our traditional songs as she holds me close, I can hear her heartbeat once again, this time clear as day. I feel safe and protected. I can feel her kissing my head and telling me it's going to be okay, Takoja, that Unchi Maka loves me. And when I open my eyes, I feel a leaf on my head where she had kissed me. All right, thank you, Jackson. And as a poet, a young poet that's you know just sharing your poems um what does it mean to you to be able to come to a gathering like this with this these elders that 
like stood up and fought the the fight back in 73 and even before that. I'm mean, certainly an honor to be able to perform my pieces in front of them because I respect them highly for being able to do that. And also this space is just an amazing space because it's so you're able to speak and you're able to be heard and it's just so welcoming and and you know just and uh, what do you hope to do um, with poetry throughout your, your life since you're just kind of getting going? Um, well, my aspiration is to make a poetry book dedicated to my poetry towards um, like our culture and, and who we are and stuff like that. As my, as my aspiration is to make a native-based poetry book. All right, well, I hope that happens. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we let you go about um, dances with words and the importance of poetry? Uh, Yeah, probably just the fact that if you're a writer or you're interested in writing, I say that you definitely should write, whether it be a journal or you're writing about your feelings or you're even just venting about something. I feel like writing is a healing, a very powerful healing method that I feel like a lot of our youth and a lot of us need to practice because poetry is important. I believe poetry is a powerful tool for Um, you know a lot of us to be able to strengthen our voices and to be heard and to um, shine light on really important issues that might not be getting a lot of limelight Um, it's great to do all the other fine arts but a lot of people should do poetry and write as well like it's a beautiful form of art I feel like so um, yeah dances with words I definitely am very proud to be a part of um, and I'm very happy that Jackson is also a part of uh, dances with words I can definitely tell Jackson has um, definitely gl- growed and glowed from being with the program so yeah thank you all right and remind me who you are again that's only little white man and where could people follow um, dances with words that are not around yours are you online or yeah, we're on Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, Facebook is more for clo- is like closed group because, you know, uh, indigenous based and like uh, reservation based, I guess. Um, but you can find us mainly on Instagram or Facebook, uh, First People's Fund's website as well. And Instagram is just um, dances with words? Dances with words underscore, all lowercase, no spaces. All right, check that out on Instagram. And Jackson, mm-hmm. um, what about you? Last words about poetry, importance of sharing your your youthful wisdom and your thoughts and feelings through your words. Um, Yeah, I think Mr. Somi pretty much said it all. Like, it's very important to be able to express what you're feeling in the moment, even if it's just in a journal or if it's just like a little little notepad or anything. Writing can help you just get your emotions out, get your feelings out. Like, I know it definitely helped me when I was grieving and when I was going through a hard time, writing was was how I coped with everything. And it's, it could turn into something really beautiful. All right, this is Franklin just interrupting. Thanks to my poets there, uh, Tessan Wynn, Little White Man, and Jackson. And one of the poets escaped before I can get my interview, and that was Ash. So we'll close out with this poem for Ash. All right, hello, my name is Ash. Here we go. The Deceased. Ceasing to exist in my life, but never my mind. Everlasting marks left where they once stood. Warmth, comfort. Their presence now gone. Lonely, drained, now so shamefully familiar. Longing for a time that once was. Memories that once caused joy. Faces I once looked at with adoration. Too painful to remember. Too heartbreaking to look at. Names once said with endearment. Pierced the air with harsh melancholy, even when only whispered. Growing dull as I wish for time to stop, the ache of absence. Wounded, only to be healed as time goes on. Acceptance, something that comes and goes far too frequently. Wishing for time to stop. Acceptance, begging for time to stop, to go back. Before those pieces of me died, before those extensions of myself left this world. Time passes, pausing for nothing, for no one. The world outside of mine has moved on, stuck in a standstill, a puddle of sorrow, lost under the covers of confliction. Better days are yet to come, despite my best days being spent with those now gone. Grief grows softer, but the tears still fall, lingering sadness, the only presence that's fully accepted. Fear of connection, becoming too close, loss, an experience that remains fresh. 
a natural part of life, yet why does it feel so wrong? No way to plan for it, no way to prepare, only brutal acceptance. Slowly closing the gaps they left behind. Loneliness remains. Longing to hold loved ones now gone. Wishing to hear voices that no longer exist. Growing around the grief, a permanent resident in my mind. Once unwelcomed, now reluctantly accepted. Slowly allowing the memories to become warm once again. Better days come, but they're incomplete. Lacking a presence. Someone to listen to the new memories. Accomplish which you should have been here to see. Happiness we should have shared. Acceptance. The want for time to stop fades. Healing only to be found as time goes. The puddle of sorrow dries up, now only coming in the form of a light shower. Grief always remains, but so do the memories. The moments once shared with those I love the most. Healing as time goes on. All right, that's it. All right, thank you. Welcome back. You're listening to Full Circle on KPFA Radio. We are part of the Pacifica Radio Network, and I'm your host tonight, Free Will and Franklin. A big shout out to the Dances with Words Poetry crew. Thank you very much for those wise words, and I'm really glad that you got to share in front of the elders who actually paved the way, you know, for all of us. And don't forget to check out Dances with Words on Instagram at Dances with Words underscore. And we will also post a link on our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show tonight. And again, tonight we are sharing audio that First Voice Apprentices, myself, Free Will and Franklin, and Sarah Blanco gathered on our trip to South Dakota to take part in the 50th anniversary of the occupation and liberation of Wounded Knee. Up next, we'll hear voices from Wounded Knee veterans and participants in the 50th anniversary gathering. These voices were recorded by First Voice graduate Sarah Blanco. Here we are at the Wounded Knee grave site. Today marks the 50th anniversary of the occupation of Wounded Knee in 1973. We're waiting for the walkers to come. So in the meantime, I'd like to sing a little song. Ya eh ha ya ya eh ha ya ya eh ha ya hey ya eh ha ya hey ya ha ya hey ya hey ya eh ha ya hey ya ha hey ya ha ya Remember me in wounded knee, shooting at the APCs. Hiya, 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 hiya. Remembering Russell means. Dennis Banks and Carter Camp, the chief of chiefs, Leonard Crowdog, ya 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 Remember me in wounded knee, shooting at the APCs. Aya, 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 Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Bertie Mestis. I'm here at the Wounded Knee grave site. Today is the 50th anniversary of the occupation of Wounded Knee. And I was here back in 1973. I was 20 years old, and I'm sitting here today at 70. I was discussing some things with a friend here, Bob, that was also in Wounded Knee. We were talking about the times in here. And, you know, I was telling him, everybody always forgets about the warriors behind the scene. All those that, you know, were out in the bunkers, all those that, you know, walked in that brought supplies for the people. I was thinking about a lot of them. I don't know if they want me to mention their names, but I'm thinking about them. Uh, you know, I was thinking about Percy Casper, 
Bo Little, uh, Henry Wawasek, Frank Chase, Dale Redboy, you know, all of them that helped, you know, when Clearwater was shot, Dale Redboy, my dad, them, they're the ones that, you know, brought him from back in the church where he got shot. And, you know, we were pinned down. And it was hard to see him. They had him on the car hood of the car, and they was driving him down. You know, that was a, a sad day to see that because he just barely got here, and that happened to him. And, you know, I think about Buddy Lamont, Pedro Bissonnette. You know, Buddy gave his life, and he's still here. He's buried here. And I'm just overwhelmed. I look forward to see a lot of him, but a lot of them are gone. There's just a few of us left now. The original ones that occupied Wounded Knee. I'm kind of getting uh, emotional. But it was a hard time, but a good time. We enjoyed each other's company. We helped each other. We looked after each other. You know, I, uh, I look for Henry Wawasik for years because he saved my mother's life because uh, she didn't know what tracers were. She went out and she was standing there and she was saying, look at all those pretty lights. And he said, get down, you know, those are bullets. And he grabbed my mother and he threw her to the ground and helped her stand. They ran down into the church, but, you know, she didn't know. So today, you know, when I sit back and think of it, you know, they killed our ancestors, you know, with guns. And today, you know, they they usually you know, do a salute. And today we're asking that the guns don't be fired. You know, let our ancestors rest. Because that's how they were killed. You know, they were shot down. You know, they didn't have a chance or anything. So today, let's respect them and say a prayer for them. And you know, Buddy and Angel Martinez are laying up there. You know, they're still here. You know, our, our fallen warriors, there are many of them. You know, there was one they called Sugar Bear. His name is Winford Red Cloud. You know, Richard Peters. There's a lot that I, re I remember. You know, and a lot of them, I just remember the names we called each other, you know, like Strawberry, you know. <laughs> I don't know where he's at, but, you know, I think about him sometimes. But I'm really uh, happy to be here. And, you know, I hope to be here for the next 30 years. You know, I'll keep coming until I can't anymore. But I'll be here. And thank you, you know, my people. And I thank all the warriors that were here that fought. And the women, the women warriors. You know, I remember a time when us women had to go out up on a hill. They gave us one rifle, and they said, all right, every now and then just sit up and fire one shot. You know, we'd fire one shot, and go. we would get about 100 rounds, and we'd just lay there, and, you know, actually they're shooting at each other, you know, one round, and they're, they're firing from that side, they're firing from that side, and we're just laying there, you know, watching them shoot at each other. <laughs> That's what they did. <laughs> but, you know, we didn't have all that ammunition, we didn't have anything, you know, just a few rifles and our prayers. It was the prayers that protected us. You know, Chief Leonard Crow Dog, you know, he was our spiritual leader and he took very good care of us. You know, Russell, Carter, Dennis, those were some brave men. You know, I wish they were still here. So, you know, with that, I'm going to say thank you. And I hope you all enjoy the meal and the powwow tonight because I know I'm going to take off before the weather gets bad so thank you all out there and thank all the people that supported wounded knee occupation thank you and can Bertie, can you tell me what we're looking at here when i'm here at the at the site what's behind me what's in front of us where are people buried at up there people are buried up on the hill to the west of us there used to be a, a Catholic church there in the front, but it got burnt down. I think the goons burnt it down. And then off to the side, you know, to the north, we had a King Cobra bunker was back there. Then we had, to the east, we had the Manderson bunker. All those APCs were always lined up up there. And then through Pine Ridge bunker and, you know, Manderson. 
So it was all around us in each direction. But from each direction, you know, the, the spirits would come to watch over, you know, if someone was coming in. So you see the hillsides, you know, all the way around, you know, they're all directions, but people managed to walk in. You know, it was mysterious, or I don't know how you would say it. If the people were walking in from the north, then for some reason they'd see them walking in from either the south, and all, you know, marshals and everything are watching that area while they're coming in on this side, when actually there's, you know, the spirits that are protecting them so they could come in. Cause the marshals all focus on what they see over there, so they're distracted from what's really happening. So as you look around, you know, you, you can see, you know, the rolling hills and go back to 1973 and I could imagine everything just the way it was, you know, the sweat lodge set right down the hill there and we had a teepee up there and, you know, all of us would be able to come and take a sweat. So I remember one time we were all went into the sweat and the a, a gunfire started. So we were in the sweat lodge while all this was happening. You know, and through all that, not one bullet hit that sweat lodge. You know, we were safe in there. And you, can you imagine all the these guns going off round after round and not one bullet would hit that lodge. That That's how strong the prayer was. That's how it was to protect us. So to be here at that time, you would have felt, you didn't feel any fear. There was no fear. It was like, this is something we needed to do. This is something we're doing for the people. So we stood strong and brave. You know, it didn't, the cold didn't bother us. You know, without food didn't bother us. We, we survived and we're still surviving today. We're still in that same struggle today. We still face the same problems. But things have improved. You know, we do have Keeley radio station. You know, we didn't have that back then. We have community colleges, which we didn't have then. And they're teaching the language to, the, to them now. Before, you know, we didn't have that. Before, you know, everyone was afraid to wear their hair long. They, they were afraid to be who they were. But now, they're proud of who they are. And that's the way it should be. You know, we're the First Nations people. This is home. This is where we are. This is where we belong. This is our land. You know, we were put here by the Great Spirit to take care of Unchi Maka, the Mother Earth. You know, so people have to understand that we all have to come together to protect Mother Earth and the water so there will be a future for our future generation of children that are coming. And I don't know if that's what everybody wants to hear, but you know, that's what I'm feeling. That's how I feel now. You know, I've got children, I've got great grandchildren, and I want to see a better future for them. So with that, I say thank you very much for this, and I feel really good today. Even though I'm getting older, but you know, you're as old as you feel. And right now, I feel like I'm 20 again. <laughs> Thank you very much. How are you feeling today? Good, good. Really good. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm a Wounded Knee 73 vet, and we try to come every year. Um, but I'm just, you know, I'm fortunate as an elder to be able to come for the 50th anniversary because many, many of our our uh, people and vets of 73 are gone now. They passed on to the spirit world. So, you know, as an elder of Wounded Knee 73 standoff, you know, I'm here uh, representing them too. I feel, I feel their energy. And um, it's a good, uh, a good time for us to pass on, you know, the not only what happened, but for the younger people that our history is a living history and it's continuing. So Wounded Knee uh, was, a, was uh, important, you know, uh, happening in the modern day of resistance. Um, but it needs to be celebrated in a way that we know that these things are going to happen. Each generation, each decade, who knows? 
because we are uh, land protectors. Thank you. Madonna Thunderhawk. My name is Shirley Feather Earring. I come to this liberation for 1973 Wounded Knee Takeover and the massacre. I'm, I come to support the walks and I walked a little but I got bad knees so I just walked so far and I got in a car and I come support them every year. I come here every year. Come support my people. Come pray. And this is a good thing that happens every year. It keeps us all strong. My mother comes, which comes, looks on every year too. She's elderly. She's old. We all come here every year. And they have in December, they have these uh, Bigfoot rides. And they have the same thing like this, but they come in on horses. They come from um, Bridger, the Bigfoot ride. When the when Bigfoot came here, that's the riders that they come every December or Christmas day. It's something like this, so it's good to see, and it's a good. It's I love it because it's it brings us all together, and that's all I got to say. Hi, I'm at Lavetta Diego, Kiowa from Lawton, Oklahoma. I'm here. As a survivor of Wounded Knee 1973, this is the 50th anniversary. Uh, I have really no feelings whatsoever because I came back here two years ago. It's when I had all the emotions come back to me. And it just brings back a lot of memories and a lot of, a lot of fun times and a good time, bad time. But, you know, but I kept the good memories with me. And it's just, uh, it just feels like I'm home. We we had we have the uh, Oglala. What is it? Oglala. We have the uh, independent nation. We became the Oglala Independent Nation. And I feel like I'm one of the one of the residents here, and it'll always be my home, even though I'm from a different tribe, a different land. But I, but I can honestly say that I have Lakota blood in my descendancy. So, but. I, I claim more Kiowa than anything else, and, but I have that blood relation that I can, you know, have, come and be with the people, and it feels good. It feels very good. So whoever, whoever has never experienced that kind of feeling, blood relations, you know, it's, if you find it, find it, find it, find you find your place in your in your in your tribe and in your family, and carry it on to your, your next generation. Uh -huh. Okay, my name is Darlene Albert. I'm full blood Ojibwe from Chippewa of the Thames in Canada. Tell us a little bit about where we're at, what we're looking at here, and what was it like back then? They were right at the the funeral site the, up the hill. There's just rows and rows of burial sites. I've been up there, but... Um, I was here. I lived in Porcupine in '73, so they would come come to my house and walk in from Porcupine, um, you know, at night. And one, one night I did walk in. Um, walk in, I sprained my hip, so I had to go to the to the clinic inside. The baby was born that day, April 11th. Um, it was it was good being there with the baby right there. I remember at the end it was it, it got pretty hungry. There was there was no food. I remember they, they had this uh, chicken. I think his rooster. I think his name was Fred, and they chased him around forever. And funny when they caught him, pried him up all pretty, and he was too tough. Nobody could eat him. <laughs> so things like that, you know, it, it's Indian life. It was it was crazy. But it was a good time. Uh, we're still still keeping up the fight. It's still, there's still a lot of prejudice in, in this country. Um, it's, it's a, I, can, I feel the strength from, from before and seeing all the people again and shaking hands and gotta, they don't recognize you because you got white hair, but you tell them who you are. It's a good time and a lot of strength. My my daughter and me got arrested in in uh, 
cussed her when she was one years old, and she she went. So we all went to jail. Somebody took her in, in Porcupine, and they knew you know knew knew my husband Ted Mean. So they they took her and and uh, we got arrested. Me and Ted got arrested. That was her birthday, March seventh. So she was in jail on her birthday. So she. And then, then we went into the wounded knee after that. Wow, that's that is definitely a lot. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? I'm just glad everybody came together, and you can feel the power of just just being here and the strength that we still hold together. That we're still still, still together. <laughs> Welcome back to Full Circle right here on 94.1 FM KPFA, part of the Pacifica Radio Network. We just heard some voices from the 50th anniversary gathering for the 1973 occupation and liberation of Wounded Knee. Big shout out to First Voice graduate Sarah Blanco for gathering those voices. Again, these recordings are part of the audio First Voice graduates gathered over a four-day period in late February, honoring the 1973 occupation of Wounded Knee. We have many hours of audio, and we'll be sharing it here and on La Onda Bajita and Flashpoints, as well as the First Voice Media Facebook page. So please check that out and stay tuned. And up next, we'll close out the show with Wala and Mateo. Wala is a Palestinian from Hebron, who is studying the similarities between Native Americans and Palestinians and the oppression they have endured through colonization. And Mateo is studying U.S. imperialism. And they have both been staying with the Lakota elders for six months, gathering information about their studies. And this interview was recorded at the Warrior Women event, which featured a roundtable discussion with 1973 occupation veterans Tune in to Full Circle next week to hear excerpts from the Warrior Women Roundtable and check out First Voice Media for video from the event. We'll be right back on Full Circle. This is Free One Franklin reporting from Porcupine, South Dakota at the 50th anniversary of the American Indian Movement Liberation of Wounded Knee 1973 to 2023. And as we find at many of these Native American gatherings, we have a solidarity member from Palestine here to also share their story. And this is Wala, and I'm going to let her and her partner, Mateo, introduce themselves and tell us why they're here. Hi, uh, my name is Wala al Qaisiya. I am from Palestine. I was uh, born and raised in the south of Palestine, in Hebron in the West Bank and uh, I am here today to be in solidarity with the people of this land and uh, as I said yesterday, um, you know, our people have long understood the commonality that we have in our struggle and, uh, and you know, I was quoting Russell Means yesterday and once he said, you know, everything that the Palestinians endure nowadays at the hand of the Israeli occupation was practiced on the American Indians. So, you know, both of our people peoples have long recognized the similar similarities, a commonality that bring us in this struggle. And so I am really honored to be here today to recognize and commemorate the work that AIM has done and particularly that the AIM matriarchs, uh, women that uh, you know I have met uh, for the, and spent some time with for the past uh, six months uh, here in South Dakota, like Madonna uh, Thunderhawk and uh, Mabel Ann and others. And it's just been so, uh, inspiring and empowering to to be here and spend time with these women and this is here is my partner uh, Matteo uh, he can also introduce himself he's always with me and he understands a lot as well about the struggle and uh, yeah so we're really pleased to be here Matteo tell us what brings you out here to this 50th anniversary well, you know, I guess as uh, life always has gets uh, its uh, chances and the gods always put on a certain path. Uh, we came here uh, in, uh, from uh, Palestine to Italy and then to Italy to New York. We are two researchers 
per respectly working on, I am working on US, the history of US imperialism in the Middle East, and she's working on uh, this comparative work between Palestine and the Lakota communities, uh, seeing how settler colonialism has uh, impacted on the lives of these communities, despite being so, you know, far away. And, you know, we came here for a month just to see what's going on, and we found out it was a Trump land full of guns, and a lot of people fixated with having babies and child. And then on the other side, you find out that the homelessness are all uh, native people. And the girls and the babies that are getting disappeared are natives. So you slowly start to get the nuances of this land, the community that you, know, that you see here, the politics that unfold. And we met this, uh, I mean, she spearheaded everything. We met this uh, wonderful Unchis matriarchs here. And uh, it has been humbling, inspiring and, you know, fantastic. And voila, you mentioned the powerful women of the American Indian movement and the roles that they played. Talk about the power of the women of Palestine and the matriarchs there. Yeah, of course. I mean, and I have done presentation recently at the Braveheart Society with Faith, Faith Spotted Eagle, another amazing uh, unchi and matriarch that, you know, who's got this beautiful community uh, center where I got to speak and present about Palestine. And I was doing that kind of comparative um, a, a kind of reflection in the presentation, talking about the history that, you know, uh, of, of our struggle, especially during the first intifada. This is uh, the moment for, for, for Palestinian revolt. This is one of the most remarkable moments in our, in our history uh, in, in the late uh, 80s. Uh, where uh, the Palestinian people um, uh, had an uprising and, uh, and it was a huge one. And women were the, the backbone of that revolution. And again, it's something that echoes what Madonna was saying today is that quite often uh, what gets down in history is the work that men do. So a lot of people might know Yasser Arafat and other uh, uh, revolutionaries, uh, men, you know, who are men and who are, the out, uh, who are always the, the, the spokesperson of the revolution. But, you know, quite often we neglect the, the work that women do. Women like Leila Khaled, the great revolutionary in, in the late 70s, uh, but also even earlier and after that. And she's a, she's, she's a great, you know, uh, inspiring woman and revolutionary, but also others whose names we may not even know because of the way that the work was being done uh, for the protection of the community. And so the, the role that the, the women played was really strategic because it wasn't really... Uh, um, uh, useful to uh, to kind of go out there and and say who you are because the Israeli intelligence service was all over you and the men were always haunted and attacked and so it was the women who secretly did the work behind you know uh, under the table and behind closed doors the, it was the women who were knocking door to door to to give bread to communities to teach children when the schools were all being bombarded or be in children were, were uh, um, or communities were under curfew and children couldn't go to school. So it was the women who were maintaining communities and community survival on a day-to-day -day basis. And that also, again, reflects what Madonna was doing with the survival school. So the similarities are really there between uh, the women in the movement from Palestine to here. And as you were talking, who came to my mind was the journalist um, Shireen, Shireen, Shireen Abu Aqleh. Name Indeed, again? yes, Shireen Abu Aqleh, who was shot recently uh, in broad daylight in Janine. You know, she was uh, wearing her ve press vest to, and and the, sh the camera was there shooting. You know, and the whole world watched her uh, death. You know, as an Israeli sniper targeted her in the head, <laughs> and so uh, you know, and 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 Shireen was was killed twice. She was killed the, the, on that day when she was sh shot in the head, she, when she was targeted. And, the, and, and again, when, when we were trying to, when Palestinians were trying to, uh, to mourn her and to, to give her a respectful uh, funeral, when, when her casket was attacked, brutally attacked by Israeli soldiers on, on that day of the funeral. So, uh, you know, uh, the story again is, is similar, you know, that brings again what, what was happening in Standing Rock, uh, you know, settlers continue to, uh, to, to want to dispossess native people and want to kill them once and twice and again, even in their death, they are always being disrespected and attacked and, uh, you know, this is similar to what Israel does with the cemeteries in Jerusalem now. A lot of cemeteries are being bulldozed and, uh, you know, there is no respect, not, neither for the living nor for the dead. Well, let's talk about some recent news because in these past couple weeks, 
the Israeli military has been conducting these brutal raids on Palestinian um, cities and villages. And in this past week, they actually did a daytime raid that killed nearly a dozen people and wounded hundreds of people. And doing your comparative studies, um, talk about how you feel when you think about what happened at Wounded Knee in 1890 when the U.S. military, and along with some settlers, massacred Native Americans, women, and children. And then even in 1973, when the military was brought out along with the vigilante squad of the goon squads, and compare that to what's happening with the Palestinians just this past couple of weeks, even more so with this new advanced weaponry that is at the disposal of the Israeli military. Yeah, it really brings it home for me, and it's uh, it's really it's triggering, you know, because it's it's constantly a reminder of home and of that trauma that I grew up with. You know, I, I had my, my next to my school one one day they bombed they bombed next to my own school, and we had to all flee. We were little children at the time, but it's one thing that I will take. You know, as she was saying, she'll take that memory to her grave, and that's that also is something that I will take with me to my grave. And it was during the second intifada when they bombed near my school and then they entered with the with the bulldozers and with the, with the big tanks and I still remember the sight of the big tank from from the window of my school and then we were all rushing as children screaming looking for our parents and running you know in panic not knowing where to hide not knowing what to do so it's it's a moment of extreme fear and unsafety that we as oppressed people have to grow up with that we have to experience as children you know they speak a lot at the UN level about children's rights where are the rights of native people of indigenous people, of people who live under a system that is designed to kill them and has no respect neither for children nor for adults nor for the elderly. And what is happening now in Palestine is a continuation of the same old story. You know, we, we, we know that they are committing massacres. We know that we did back in the past and we know that they will continue to do so. And that there is no, because there is nobody who's coming out there to, to make a stop. The international community can easily be blinded by all of these war crimes and only you know pick and choose whichever ones to focus on and others not you know not to even mention and we've seen a lot of that hypocrisy with the war in Ukraine and you know BBC reporting usually coming and saying these are blue-eyed children these are white-skinned folks as if you know if you are white and, and blue-eyed this the, you have no right to die but if any other skin then it's all uh, rightful killing and you know this is really it's it's again it highlights the similarities of the struggle and uh, you know the raids now what we have in, in this uh, moment is one of the most fascist Zionist governments ever and their, their goals are very clear you know they're not mincing their words Netanyahu has came has come out and said you know what I want to do is that everywhere uh, from the West Bank which he calls in his own biblical terms as Judea and Samaria to the Galilee to everywhere in quote-unquote Israel is only for settlers it was only and exclusively for, Jew for Jewish settlers so the goals of the Israeli governments are very clear and you know everyone can just go and and learn about it rather than listen to US media because there's a lot of distortion in the way that this uh, story is being reported and so it's events like this where we can come out in solidarity but also to share our you know common struggle and talk about all of the brutality of this system that we live under. And I guess the last thing I could um, talk about, since they're sharing so many similarities between what's happening to Native people here in the United States and what's happening in Palestine to the Palestinian people, is also being aided and contributed to by the U.S. government. So, and I know you're you're studying U.S. imperialism. So, uh, how do you feel about um, everything that we've been talking about over these last few hours? and what's going on in Palestine is really being aided by U.S. military and financial support. Yeah, unfortunately, we're seeing this on so many levels. Uh, the United States has created an economy worldwide that uh, has an appetite for war, unfortunately. And uh, we're seeing this in the Middle East. Uh, we're seeing this in Europe, in Ukraine. We're seeing this in so many theaters all over the world. Uh, there is a need to keep this um, war machine going. Israel is, uh, you know, the 
the, the Palestinian uh, uh, left wing, uh, political left wing, used to call Israel uh, the spearhead of American imperialism in the region. Because it's not just uh, destroying the Palestinians, it's also making sure that no solidarity regionally is built to counter this uh, entity. And you know, this is happening all over, over again. We're seeing this in many different theaters. And, uh, and I hope, my hope is that, uh, you know, this, as the Americans can see this, you know, as is happening in Ferguson, as is happening with the native people, it, it, it's not something that just takes place outside. Sooner or later, it's gonna come home and it's time to wake up, you know, because it might be too late. And remind everyone your name again and uh, oh. where you're coming from. Uh, my name is Matteo Capasso. I'm uh, based at Columbia University, but I come from Italy. And then lastly, over to you, Wala. What is your message to American people who just blindly support Israel, even at the cost of all these Palestinian lives? It's your taxpayer money, you know, it's, it's in billions, in millions that has been given to the Israeli government. And for what? To support uh, uh, an illegal occupation uh, of, of a people um, that, you know, on the international uh, level, you know, international law has declared that all of these settlements are illegal. So, uh, you know, do you want to, uh, to have your taxpayer money to, to go for this uh, illegal entity and for the violence that is... Uh, is uh, subjecting uh, our people to. Uh, I mean, I, I think that the, the answer to that question is pretty straightforward to me. But, you know, if any American who is listening today, just d do some digging and uh, get a bit more informed about where your taxpayer money is going. And also, uh, you know, get into movement and g become more politically conscious. Because, again, that kind of deadly exchange be between the United States and, and Israel is coming home, you know. And it happens in, on the intelligence level, on the security level on even the equipment and the weapons that is being bought in from uh, Israel and brought here to suppress any civilized movement, any progressive movement to change the face of this country for the better. So uh, get informed, become more conscious and uh, make a stop to um, illegal Israeli occupation, but also to the brutality you know, of, of, the, of this system here as well, because it's, it's connected. You have to fight it home. And so eventually it will also get out there. Uh, the, the two struggles are very connected. And remind uh, people who are uh, speaking and where you're from. My name is Wala, and I am from Hebron, uh, south of uh, West Bank uh, in Palestine. And that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Remember to check out our website, kpfaapprentice.org, just after the show tonight for pictures, archive shows, and important links and information related to tonight's show. Also, please check out First Voice Media on Facebook for videos from our trip to Wounded Knee. Shout out to the Full Circle crew, Miss M, the Executive Director, and me, Free Will and Franklin. I have been your host tonight. I'm also the technical director for this show, Full Circle. Again, thanks for listening, everyone. And remember, while you're out there, to please protect your health and also your humanity. And stay tuned to KPFA. Up next is La Onda Bajita. Good night, everyone. KPFA has always been more than a radio station. We're a local destination for discussion and connection. When you turn on 94.1 FM or check out KPFA's website, you too belong to the Bay Area. Our local programming, news, analysis, culture, and alternative music is reflective of where we live, who we are today, and how we're growing as a vehicle for community engagement. Please donate today at kpfa.org. Thank you. KPFA is on social media. Follow us on your favorite platforms for news headlines, live stream events, show info, and more. That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Wednesday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight, tune in to The Nightcap with me, Mo, 
an eclectic mix of music that's a treat at the end of your day. That's The Nightcap on Wednesday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight with me, Mo, here on KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org.